Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. Sound plays a more important role in human behavior and our decision-making than you may realize. In this podcast, I'll help you understand the art and science of sound so you can better influence others in business and your life. I'm your host, Jody Krangle. Let's delve a little deeper. I was going to ask you psychologically what this actually does to our brains when we're working through this. So when yeah. you're working with someone, uh, like, are there stages that they go through? Uh, what's the, you know, the latest research on all of this? Well, it really depends, again, on the goals that we're working on. So, um, you know, we might be working on cognition, like attention, um, executive functioning things or social relational needs or emotional or communication. Um, so, you know, psychologically that can look, look different, but if we are working on more of those social emotional, um, processes, then, um, a lot of things are going on, but it depends on the person and where their brain began, uh, because, um, every, and maybe we'll talk about this a little bit, but everybody's brain as, as the experiences we have, everything affects those neural connections and what gets formed, what doesn't get formed. Um, so yeah, so this is a big question, <laughs> but, um, I would say if you boil it down, some of the really neat things that, that does happen psychologically, um, and, and very often, for most people, uh, is when we even hear our, anticipate our favorite music, dopamine is released and dopamine is a chemical that, um, helps us feel more motivated. It's a chemical that's actually used for a lot of different processes in our body. Um, but it, it's one of the chemicals that, uh, we think of, is the reason why ADHD happens when people have a hard time regulating dopamine or have low dopamine. Okay. That's why they might feel like not motivated because the dopamine levels are way down. So uh, put on some good music, especially music with a very steady beat. Every time you have, focus. yeah, every time that beat goes, it drips a little bit of dopamine. Okay. And so that's another reason why we also can support people with, um, with their gait, like with walking, because we need that little bit of drip of dopamine when we walk. It actually naturally happens. Mm -hmm. But for people that have a challenge with that, like for Parkinson's, maybe a stroke, that gets affected. So if we have a very steady beat, boom, boom, every little bit, dopamine drips. And it actually helps to regulate our system and anticipate when to take those steps. Um, that is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that's just one. <laughs> wow. Yeah, there's a lot that goes on. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm, I'm curious about Alzheimer's because I've heard that uh, music really reaches people with uh, memory issues. Mm -hmm. So have you had to deal with some of that as well? Yes. Yes. So I worked with the symphony um, to develop a program for, for them to go in um, and work with the older adults. But then... Uh, so I kind of trained them how to help clients be at like homeostasis. Um, but during that training period, I got to be in there a lot with, with the older adults and we did a lot of, of singing and, um, there was one, uh, older woman who I could just tell by her vocal quality that she had been in choirs and normally she didn't talk very much, um, uh, cause she was in the later stages of Alzheimer's. But I, I went, I was singing, we were singing Edelweiss and um, went up to her, we were singing. And afterwards I asked her, I said, have you, were you in a choir? And sh she said, yes. And we had a little conversation and it was so wonderful. And just that emotional connection with her and just seeing her like as a person, it, I don't know, it just was very impactful for me. Um, I'm sure it was for her too. Yeah. Cause I mean, when was the last time she was able to actually have a conversation with someone? Mm -hmm. I mean, that was probably big news for her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that, 
the way that music activates and kind of the memory areas, it creates biographical memory. And so that's mm. why we associate music with special events. Uh, whether they're, you know, super happy events or super sad events, that emotional piece tied with the music, it really gets, it gets encoded deeply into the brain. And so we can, um, because music naturally activates the limbic system, all the areas associated with emotions, it so quickly can bloop, bring that, all those feelings back that we had associated with that song or that. Oh, yeah. You know, it's memory. Fascinating. Yes. Yeah. So we all love the music that we grew up with, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> normally what um, as music therapists, we use music that is from about like 19 through 25, like, you know, for wh whatever years the person was that age, between that mm -hmm. age, the young adult span, that's what we try to start with at least and see yeah. kind of what you know, what sparks their interest. It's amazing that it's that conscious that, mm. you know, you can actually go back and look at the music that was popular in that time period and say, that's the music they're yeah. likely to yeah. connect with. Because that's, yeah. I mean, that if we think about our lives too, that's when we were like more solidly ourselves, you know, through like the rock Discovering <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's just when when we listen to a lot of music so it's so true yeah so um does the music connection build connections again like in in people with alzheimer's i'm wondering if it like rebuilds or if it just is there for a minute and then goes away mm -hmm. again yeah i think it depends on the person mm -hmm. um for example we worked in a facility where we would do music therapy groups. Um, and there was a gentleman who was there for a year and he really, he really didn't talk much. Um, and then after one music therapy group, the administrator came in and he said, like, how are you doing? You know, and they ended up having a full blown conversation about current politics. And he, wow. he, he told me because he was blown away because he hadn't heard many words from this man. But apparently he was paying attention <laughs> and something clicked in there after the music. Um, I'd say, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's, they are oh, just such an awful disease. Um, and it's obviously can't reverse it. But I think if you keep your mind as active as possible, then you can at least hopefully slow it down. And I think music is one of those things. Like I said, it exercises the whole brain. And so if you can keep that connection to other people, that's going to keep you healthy. When we, when we're isolated, as we know that your health is going to decline. And so that connection through the music can be so powerful. Even like I mentioned with that woman, you know, with this gentleman, uh, when we can no longer have verbal conversations, we can still spark that with, with the music and help to keep that part of the brain a little more active than it would be if we didn't otherwise. Yeah, it's so good to know that that's possible. But along those lines now, I'm curious if there's a difference between listening to music and making music. Yes, yes. So I did look up some research um, because I think there's mixed, there's mixed, uh, mixed research on that. And okay. I think it's because people are so different and music therapists are so different. Everybody practices a bit differently. So I did look at a research study that was a meta-analysis and it took all these different studies and boiled down uh, the findings of them. And they also looked at um, random control trial studies of music therapy. So this study looked at looked at actually 55 random control trials and um, of music therapy as well as music medicine because it wanted to see the difference between active music making and receptive music making. So active would be obviously actively making music. So like improvisation, songwriting, um, recreating songs that are client preferred. The receptive listening, which is usually more music medicine, would be, you know, earphones on listening to music. And what they found um, was that 
they had, they both worked, but they had different applications. And so the, um, the active music making, which was, you know, improvisation, recreating music, songwriting, that was more effective for fostering social interaction, for emotional expression, and for motor coordination, which makes sense because when you're actively making the music, you're able to get it into your body and express it. Um, and also there's, I don't know if you're familiar with mirror neurons. Um, when we move certain ways, it activates mirror neurons in other people. So like when, when oh. I smile, then you smile back, you know, or when you smile, I smile back. That's our mirror neurons boop, boop, like activating because socially it connects us with each other. I mean, if you're ever on the street yeah. and you smile at somebody and they're like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and just frown, then it feels bad. Um, yeah. <laughs> but but that would explain why people sway in a concert together. Yes, exactly. Yeah, That's yeah, mirror yeah. neurons. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Got and it. so it's that active participation that actually connects us to people. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's, you know, moving to, to drum or even moving at a concert, you know, dancing, that actually can increase empathy, uh, which is another interesting research. But yeah, so that social interaction, the emotional expression, and then motor coordination, because in motor coordination, we need to make sure we're starting at the right beats per minute, and we're, we're not too fast for the person, we're not too slow. If it's the wrong timing, then it's not going to be effective for that person to be able to coordinate their movements with. So that's what they found the active music making was the best for. Um, the receptive music listening, they found it reduced stress, anxiety, and promoted relaxation, which makes a lot of sense because a lot of times as music therapists, when we use receptive um, listening experiences, it is for a coping skill to reduce stress. Usually it's in relation to somebody who has anxiety or maybe depression to reduce um reduce that, you know, feelings of stress. And then also it can reduce cortisol, which is our stress hormone. Um, and the more we can reduce that, we're going to help actually just our overall health because when we have chronic stress, um, increases that cortisol and that cortisol can lead when it's constant can lead to a lot of health issues. Especially in perimenopause and menopause, yes. shall I point out? <laughs> yes. That is actually a number one thing that uh -huh. women need to do. They need to yep. try to do things to re reduce their cortisol. Yeah. Definitely. Yep. Yeah. Um, speaking of ways to reduce stress, <laughs> uh, what, do you, what do you think about using music therapy and parenting? Mm. How can that best be used? Yeah. And, and how does it affect both the parents and the kids? Yes. Yeah. So if you do have a child who has severe emotional challenges, then I would connect with a the music therapist to explore that specifically. Um, but if you are looking for just ways to you know, um, support that attachment because every child needs to feel secure with their attachment figure, which might be their mother, father, aunt, uncle, grandparent, whoever is their main caregiver. Without that secure attachment, they're going to have challenges further on in their life with every relationship. So if we look at that as the foundation of how do we strengthen that bond of that attachment, really any music making is going to be valuable um, for our non-musician, you know, p uh, parents. I usually suggest things like improvising on the piano with white keys. Only play the white keys, or improvising on the piano with only the black keys, um, because that's going to keep you either in key of C on the white keys or in a pentatonic on the black keys. And it's going to sound really cool and really fun as long as your child can follow that one-step direction of you know, and have impulse control of only playing on the black keys or the white keys. That's the trick. Yes. Yes, it is. I've tried. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that can be a really fun way to connect again in a nonverbal way. So it feels less threatening, but you're mm -hmm. having that emotional connection. You're releasing dopamine, you're releasing serotonin, which is our feel good chemical. Um, and you're doing it together. You're doing it together and you're releasing oxytocin which is a bonding chemical. And so mm. you are 
nor your neurotransmitters are helping you to actually bond and have that grow that attachment even stronger through the music making um playing drums together i was gonna i was gonna ask you about that if drums was one of the easier ones to yeah definitely (laughs) we have a ton of drums because they're super accessible um if you you could do like a call and response where you do a little beat and then they do a little beat sometimes they like to do a long beat but then you do a little beat (laughs) and that again is a conversation you're Mm -hmm. taking turn you're practicing taking turns impulse control all at the same time but you're connecting and what i like about the drum is you're face to face and so a lot of research shows that having that facial affect again those mirror neurons um connecting back and forth that is really, really important for attachment and for a bonding with your child. I love it. Yeah, so important. Yeah. So if someone wanted to have a music therapy session, what would they do? What's the easiest way to make that happen? Yeah. So a music therapy session with me or just in general? (laughs) Well, with you as well. But in general, what would they need to have figured out before they could do that? Okay. Yeah. So to find a music therapist, um, you could go two routes. So one is you could look up um, the American Music Therapy Association. Now, not every music therapist is part of that, but that's one way that you could find a music therapist through them. You could also contact the certification board for music therapists. Um, You can look up the list there, but I don't recall if it actually has the contact information there. Um, so you could call CBMT and say, Hey, I live in such and such town and I'm looking for a music therapist for, you know, for autism, for Parkinson's. And they, I believe they will try to connect you with, you know, whoever's closest to you and also applicable that has a, a specialty in your area of need. Is there an international uh, certification or anything like that? Um, because, you know, the people outside of the States. Oh, yeah. I'm just curious, absolutely. like, where they would look. So what I would suggest is to look up, if you Google, um, music therapy in your country or music therapy in your state um, and see what comes up. It might be a little bit of a treasure hunt for some some places have more or less music therapy. Um, Europe does have quite a lot. And so mm-hmm. you might be able to find somebody, uh, especially in more of more of the UK. Um, but another option, I don't know if they have an actual search for music therapists, but there is a World Federation of Music Therapy as well, which might be a great place to look if um, if you can't find a music therapy organization that's near you. Mm-hmm. And if you're in the States, is this ever covered by insurance? Mm, good question. It is very much case by case. So we okay. are still lobbying <laughs> to try to get that reimbursement. Uh, it has, I would say, it depends on your diagnosis, depends on the insurance you have, um, depends on the specific goals that we're working on. And so for the most part, the main areas that we have gotten reimbursed for are for um, communication needs. But otherwise, it has been a challenge to be able to to get that third party reimbursement. Yeah, I can imagine it would it would be a little tough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're not going to give that up easily, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, we've been trying for a while. Yes. Yeah. Well, hopefully that works out and and that can be covered, at least in certain instances. I think yeah. that would help a lot of people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So how can people get in touch with you if they'd like to learn more about what it is you do and maybe book a session? Sure. Yeah. So you can uh, book a free call with me at my website. It's amusictherapy.com. And there's a little box at the top that says um, book a free consultation. You can just click on that, pick a time and day that works for you, and then we'll chat. That sounds wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Noelle. This has been really informative and I love what you do and I wish you every continued success with it because clearly it's needed. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much, Jody. Well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, why not tell a friend about this podcast? It's available in all the usual locations. Until next time.